Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation uh, uh, to be here at this conference. Um, we always enjoy very much to uh, share with uh, stakeholders across Europe uh, and to connect. And yes, we were invited to speak um, about some results of uh, an initiative called Sustainable Practices of Integration Spring, um, which was very much concerned with this notion of good practices, um, what it actually means, um, but also the transfer of good practices. Um, that is something that is much promoted at the European level. Uh, it is all over the place. We just heard uh, an example where you are collecting good practices. Um, and it's clear, I mean, it's about not re reinventing the wheel, uh, but to transfer know-how and tap into the experience that exists uh, already in other countries. So very briefly on the Spring project, um, it was basically an initiative that took the needs of practitioners and the people behind integration practices as a starting point, um, aimed to support practitioners, um, well, to build uh, professional partnerships uh, across uh, borders, uh, to make integration policies more evidence-based, to make research results more accessible for practitioners, um, and then also to promote um, and understand better this notion of, of good practices. What is it actually what makes a good practice and how good practices spread? Um, you are invited to have a look at um, the, the website. There are numerous tools, uh, uh, outputs, toolkits, etc., to download, including a data bank of assessed good practices. So our role as MPG in spring was to, well, well, it was twofold. Uh, first of all, we developed a kind of evaluation grid for good practices uh, together with um, experts, uh, grassroots organizations to, to find out a little bit what, what are the key criteria. Um, and then looking into the conditions of transfer and, and transfer of uh, knowledge. Um, so, on that, we, do, we did basically two things. Um, um, first of all, an empirical analysis, uh, uh, where we looked into 24 cases of integration practices that actually were transferred to another country. Um, actually, Estonia was among uh, the examples uh, which my colleague who did the research uh, looked at. Um, uh, including the Integration Foundation. Um, and to better understand what, what is it here, what is taking place, um, disentangling a little bit the various dimensions. And then in a the second step, we turned this insight into a toolkit, a practitioner toolkit. This is, this is built around like 20 questions um, to ask um, for everyone who's interested in, in developing a new integration practice that would be uh, inspired by an international model. Um, some key findings from this um, empirical research is, first of all, it's, it's very high on political agendas. Uh, um, uh, good practices, um, spreading of good practices, mutual learning, but actually there aren't that many cases out there. Uh, so there's a kind of disbalance between this, this promotion of, of sharing good practices and then actually seeing cases where things were adapted in another country. So a good practice apparently is not necessarily or automatically a transferable practice. Um, then it's interesting that the most of these cases are more general integration programs, are more concerned with labor market integration, and then you have areas like health and housing uh, where it seems to be very difficult. Um, and then it's also something that is not happening top-down, but, but very much in, in networks, horizontally. Um, it's not simply duplicating uh, practices, it's more about adapting uh, models. Um, and then there is something about uh, scope, budget, uh, funding sources as well. So we, we try to turn all these insights into this uh, toolkit, 
um, where we kind of identified four dimensions um, uh, at play here that and where in each dimension practitioner could ask like five questions um, and the more of these questions can be answered in a satisfactory way I would say the more uh, the more likely it is that uh, transferring a practice is successful so there are two dimensions here um, that are more looking at the model uh, uh, the quality of the practice um, and then the practical transferability of this practice and then there are two dimensions where it's about looking at the own context um, what is the capacity to adapt uh, are we well prepared um, and then the transfer conditions the actual process of transferring good practices So concerning this first dimension, um, so, so what is it exactly what makes a good practice? Huh? Uh, how do you recognize a good practice? Um, there are probably five, five key questions to ask. First, does the supposed model practice follow an inclusive and participatory approach? Um, does it really... Um, respond to specific needs uh, and vulnerabilities of various groups of, uh, of, of target groups? Um, and is this um, developed in a way that is really involving uh, the, the beneficiaries? So this is what we understand as inclusive and participatory approach. And I think, Carolis, you will uh, discuss this later on as well. Um, very important here is the, the, the involvement of, of beneficiaries in a meaningful way in the whole process of designing, implementing, monitoring, in evaluating an integration practice. Um, the second question to ask um, is this supposed model um, relevant and complementary? Which means, is, is it important to, to fill a gap uh, in the integration support uh, ecosystem, if you want. Um, is it really relevant uh, for systematic improvement? Um, does it fit into the priorities of other stakeholders? Is it part of a broader integration strategy? Then the third criteria is, um, and that is, of course, maybe most interesting when somebody is interested in transferring and adapting a, pr a practice. Um, is the model practice effective? Huh? Are there any tangible results um, of, of this integration policy or program or project um, that, is, that are confirmed through systematic assessment? Um, are there very clear implementation plans? Um, has there been constant monitoring? Is there evaluation of outcomes? The fourth criteria uh, is sustainability. Um, are practices long viable in the long run? Uh, is there some structural funding? Is there um, a business model perhaps uh, generating own uh, resources? Um, has it existed, if you look at it as, as a potential model, has it existed already for a long time? Because, of course, this will give a strong indication that there is something about its sustainability. Um, the last question to ask here is, um, does the supposed model strive for cooperation uh, and partnerships? Um, a good integration practice is actually reaching out uh, to its ecosystem of, of other actors, stakeholders, implementing um, um, integration policies. So it should be embedded into, into a system. And you can see whether an integration practice actually does that or is more isolated and is not really, really connected. 
Um, so we, we developed this evaluation grid uh, of good practices um, that actually also informed the self-assessment um, uh, part of the UNHCR toolkit, of which we will uh, hear more afterwards. And we also uh, produced together with um, uh, practitioners a repository of 56 practices, which were looked at along exactly these uh, criteria. Um, and of course, that good practice doesn't exist. Um, no practice ticks all these boxes at the same time. But I think this evaluation grid really gives um, some support in, in looking at the right uh, things. Now, the second dimension when it's about transferring is um, looking at this very practical level of um, yeah, does, does the practice lend itself to being adapted? Um, because not every practice um, is, is easily adaptable. So the first question to ask is the model practice based on a clear core idea and a simple principle. It's a fact that most practices that you find that are transferred are based on a very straightforward um, idea. So think about neighborhood mothers, think about bridging courses at on qualifications, um, think about um, one-stop shop uh, concepts in early integration. So it's always having these clear cuts and plausible best principles that most easily uh, transferred. Second question to ask is, um, is information about the model practice readily available? Seems simple, but it's not actually, uh, because not every model is very well documented. Often it's only in the la uh, uh, country language. Uh, language barrier problems come in. And here we already see what is really, really relevant in most cases are personal contacts between a model and uh, um, the uh, people who want to develop a new practice. Um, the third question to ask, um, are there elements of the model practice that could be adapted in a standalone way? Uh, that is especially interesting for smaller organizations. Um, often it's more about um, um, step-by-step -step adaption, it's about uh, particular methodologies, techniques and modalities that are more easier to transfer. Um, the fourth question to ask is, oh, sorry, um, is the model separable from the original institutional context? That is quite important because very often integration practices are very much embedded in national contexts, um, referring to how policy fields are organized, how, um, how competences are shared between central government and the local level, the role the civil society plays uh, in a country. In some countries, um, integration policies are very state-dominated. In other countries, civil society uh, has a very big role. In other countries, civil society actually um, takes over the role of the state. Um, think about how labor markets are organized. Um, an example that comes to my mind is because we have worked a lot in the field of migrant entrepreneurship, chamber of commerce. In some countries, there are uh, there is compulsory membership. There are really service uh, providers uh, for the members. So they are really important actors that can achieve a lot in terms of improving support for migrant businesses. In other countries, they are simply um, interest organizations, interest representations. Um, so you really have to be aware about um, what are the country-specific contexts, and very often this is also a big obstacle uh, to, to transferring practices. Um, the last question here is, um, yeah, has the model already proven to be transferable and adaptable? Obviously, um, if there are already cases of, uh, of a model that has been transferred, uh, there has to be something about its transferability. Of course, it also means that there, are, there is a bigger community of practitioners uh, with experiences to uh, tap in. 
Um, and let's turn to the other two dimensions, um, more looking at the own side, um, the capacity to adapt. Yeah? Um, is the practice suitable to the receiving context and are the frame conditions in place to successfully adopt it? First question to ask, is the model practice applicable under our social, cultural, socio-economic, institutional and political frame conditions? So this is about an applicability check, uh, looking into whether, for example, uh, what regards to beneficiaries, uh, the situation is comparable. Think about uh, the structure of migration flows, uh, the share of refugees, the share of recently arrived, the share of undocumented. Uh, is, is this target uh, group really the same? Um, but also comparability in terms of uh, the receiving society. Uh, what again about the role of uh, um, civil society in some countries, there's a stronger tendency, to, tendency for volunteering, for example. There are practices based on uh, volunteers. Um, what about discrimination? Um, spaces of intervention, what about um, the differences of integration policies conducted in an urban context or in a rural context? What about availability of social infrastructures, um, availability of, of employment? So this is all the context of integration practices where there could be a reason why it is actually quite difficult to transfer or adapt a practice. Um, second question, and this is coming back then to these criteria for good practices, is... Um, is this practice actual, that we plan accurately responding to clearly established needs of migrants in our context? Is it really based on a stakeholder, multi-stakeholder needs assessment where not only the beneficiaries but all integration players have been involved in identifying whether there is actually a need uh, and what is the specific need uh, for this uh, uh, planned project or program, of course, you can also refer to an integration strategy, but the strategy then should be very well developed and also based on a very clear needs assessment. A third question here to ask is, um, again, does adapting the model contribute to the wider integration support system? Coming back to this criteria, what does it mean here in our context? Um, does it really uh, align with the uh, um, priorities of, of the strategic players? Um, good is to have a strategy of engagement with the different stakeholders um, um, already to, to get their support, uh, leading then also to better sustainability. Next question, can we fulfill our practical requirements uh, to implement an adapted model practice? This is more the feasibility check in terms of the organizational needs. Um, what about uh, the budget, um, staff competences, are there needs to, to uh, train staff? Um, what about organizational leadership? Are there higher levels of the organization behind it? Um, is there a strong commitment? I remember a case of a network project where a very engaged partner out of a sudden couldn't move anymore, uh, just stopped uh, implementing a new practice uh, because uh, a responsible city councillor uh, stepped back. Uh, so all these questions come in here. Last question here to ask is, can we build stakeholder support and commitment for implementing and sustaining an adapted model? This is exactly about getting uh, the support of, of policymakers and possible um, funders in the process of reaching out, speaking with them, really seeing what are their interests in the new practice to get their buy-in, leading to more uh, support. Then looking at the transfer conditions, um, first question, and that is the really important one, will we receive active support from the model practice? What we see in the research is that actually every 
project that was successfully adopted had some sort of direct involvement of a model. Um, and these personal contacts really play a key role. Um, where to find these contacts, uh, obviously, is the involvement in European networks. Um, that could be civil society-led networks, uh, like ENA, uh, PICOM, uh, you name it, uh, networks around European uh, programs run by the European Commission. Um, it could also be networks around uh, local and regional authorities like Eurocities, uh, the Intercultural Cities Network. But here it's really where this insider information comes from, where this tacit knowledge uh, can be found. And then the next question is, how will we involve the model practice in the adaptation process? Um, ideally, um, it's, it's a straightforward project where a model practice could be involved in, in the entire phase of phases of developing it, testing it, monitoring it, um, ideally with action plan, uh, um, 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 pilot actions being implemented, um, so that they are really involved throughout uh, this process. Third question, are we prepared for a lengthy process of learning and adaptation? It simply means it is a long process, including um, all these stages, uh, needing the relevant resources in organizations. Actually adapting a process like this is more demanding in, times or in terms of, of time and resources than simply developing a new uh, uh, project because this involves all this uh, um, interaction. Then the third question here, um, oh sorry, the fourth question is, um, yeah, how will we monitor, evaluate, and modify the adapted practice? This is about having uh, the methodolo methodology right. Uh, very important, of course, um, and then the last, um, question to ask, how we will develop and co confirm a sustainability perspective already in this process, because this is actually the best time to get all the stakeholders involved and uh, showing them that there is something developed following an international good practice. Um, to, just to conclude, um, I think there are two main points coming out of this. Um, it's this overwhelming importance of networking and, and interpersonal contacts. Um, um, without that, only having collections of good practices, uh, um, what you always see, yeah, this, this huge databases of, of um, uncommented uh, good practices is not enough. Um, so it's really this interpersonal contacts. But the problem is that that also takes time and resources, and often that is not reimbursed for people working in the field. Um, and that is leading to a second uh, conclusion is um, there needs to be more structural support, I think, continuous support for these entire processes. At the moment, we have a situation where there are very often calls for projects, like we see here. Um, where it's an on-off call on a specific topic, um, then projects are being implemented that actually foresee this transfer and mutual learning of good practices, but then it's over again. Um, and that is maybe something that, that um, European, but also national funding organizations should really think about, that there would be more continuous structural support for on an ongoing rolling ba basis, um, open to various topics, uh, that would make a real big, big difference. Thank you for your attention, and I'm sure that there are some people here in the room who will have very similar experiences. Thank you. Alexander. Thank you so much for your insightful presentation. And um, uh, it was 
wonderful in the sense that uh, it is the most important thing actually to ask the right questions and how many undertakings have failed just because we've sat down and just failed to ask the right questions. So now we have a lot of them and I would like to um, give the chance uh, to ask questions uh, to our online uh, audience and um, we have one question for you. Um, uh, which is, um, you largely spoke about theoretical features characterizing a good practice, but could you please provide a practical example of a good practice? There are many, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about migrant uh, businesses again, um, because we worked in this area and we had cases where, yeah, we actually did this whole process and we saw exactly how important it is yeah? um, and also how difficult it actually is yeah? to, to build the sustainability perspective, especially because you have often this pilot phase and then afterwards um, it's it's this lack of, of further funding. Uh, so, so building the stakeholder support maybe is really the most um, difficult thing in many cases. Um, of course, effective practices, uh, there are many. Um, I, I think I mentioned um, one-stop shop concepts. Um, I think this is also what was implemented here in Estonia. Um, Inclusivity, parti uh, participation, um, there are good processes where I'm thinking about the city of Ghent in Belgium, for example, um, where there was actually it's an anti-colonialism uh, action plan in the city, uh, which was created together with migrant communities uh, coming up with a huge action plan far, going far beyond um, eliminating um, um, colonial reminders in public space, but going into uh, diversity planning in schools, um, um, etc. Uh, so, so they are really good uh, practices. But again, it's, it's important to make them not only visible, but to create the networks where this knowledge can be spread uh, and um, practitioners can come together, especially when it's about involving um, migrant communities um, to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you again for this profound uh, account.